this meeting is about uh, uh, finding a reasonable uh, solution for transitioning uh, funding for harm reduction from uh, the global fund to uh, domestic funds. How do you see this procedure in general? Like, what are the challenges? What are the difficulties? Well, this is never an easy process. The process of moving from one format or mechanism of funding to another mechanism is always uh, a challenging process, but we shouldn't look at it only as a massive challenge. We should also see it as an opportunity. Uh, and particularly, uh, we have many very positive examples across the region of Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia where uh, what I would call very timely seed funding from the Global Fund has been able to establish evidence-based, very focused, very timely programs that have saved the lives of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, both people directly affected by HIV and drug use, uh, but also many people who are also living with HIV, already infected with HIV, and these programs have been absolutely essential to ensure that they uh, get access to HIV testing on a voluntary basis, that they are able to access treatment, and that they're able to also uh, care for themselves and, and be, a, be a very positive and productive member of their community and their society. So these programs have been tremendously successful, almost uniformly across the region. Our concern on behalf of UNAIDS is twofold. Uh, first of all, that the overall uh, scale or level of coverage of these programs is still very, very small. And for these programs to really not only be effective for the number of clients that are benefiting from the services, but for them to be effective from a public health point of view, for them to have a decisive impact on the course of the epidemic, uh, they need to be rapidly scaled up. So this, this issue about transition to other sources of funding and uh, global solidarity and shared responsibility is actually a very timely uh, development so that we can talk not only, not only about who's going to pay for these services, but how we can move from very large, very successful pilot programs to programs that can cover all of the people in need of these services across the region. So it should be an opportunity to think out of the box to really move from effective evidence-based uh, designed programs to programs that will be scaled up fully. And this is a very timely call because it was just a couple of days ago at the UN General Assembly in New York that all the heads of state uh, and all the UN member states unanimously adopted the new post-2015 development agenda, the so-called Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and goal 3.3 is no less ambitious than ending AIDS by 2030. And so we will never end AIDS anywhere, including in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, if we don't end the HIV epidemic in every individual community that is affected by this epidemic. So ending AIDS globally or even regionally means we also end the epidemic, not control HIV, but actually end AIDS amongst injecting drug users, amongst uh, sex workers, amongst men who have sex with men, amongst any community that is disproportionately at risk or affected by the epidemic. And all the evidence exists from the Global Fund supported programs, from the national uh, programs in the region, that not only are uh, programs focused on these key populations a priority, but they're a very good investment. They pay off tremendously. And of course, from a global headlines point of view, we always pay most attention to the countries that have the biggest epidemics and the countries where the statistics are out of control or growing year by year. But already at this amazing dialogue, we heard from the former mayor of Prague this morning. And Prague is a very good example because they actually almost don't have an HIV epidemic, at least not an HIV epidemic amongst their injecting drug users. Why? because for the last 20 years, almost 20 years, they have implemented systematically low threshold, evidence-based, harm reduction programs, needle exchange programs. They're community-based, easily accessible, and as a result, they not only have controlled their HIV epidemic amongst injecting drug users, they've stopped it before it even started. And so that's a very positive example that not only can these programs work, but these programs can actually be successful with the support of local funding and with the support of the local government.
because it's actually a little bit easier to talk about all the ambitious and innovative things that can be done on HIV prevention and on programmatic interventions when it's being paid for by an external donor, even one as, as generous as the Global Fund. But if we want these programs to really be successful in the long term, they have to be owned and supported and funded by the local governments. And that's why this dialogue is so extremely important. And it's not something where we need to, to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Uh, there's a number of governments, I mentioned the Czech Republic, there's a number of governments across the region who haven't even waited for their epidemics to get out of control. They've actually put the programs in place, invested the resources, and not necessarily, you know, millions or billions of dollars or pounds or euros, uh, but done so on a timely basis, supporting communities uh, in a very evidence-based approach to put in the programs that actually support people, protect public health, and stop an epidemic before it gets out of control. And this is the time where we need to learn from those lessons, and we need to very urgently scale up these sorts of programs uh, as we move towards the end of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, UNAIDS invested a lot into proving that harm reduction is effective, a lot of studies and research, but there are still some governments uh, which did not provide adequate funding for harm reduction after the Global Fund removed its funding, for example, Serbia, Montenegro, or some recent cases. So what can the UNAIDS do to, to engage in a dialogue with these governments? Do you have any possibilities to, to, uh, to, 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 to start a dialogue with those governments and convince them that they have to continue funding? Well, in fact, we, we have a, an ongoing dialogue with all 193 United Nations member states. Uh, and we're very happy that all of the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia provide us practically on an annual basis a progress report on how they're doing on HIV and AIDS based on the commitments that all UN member states made at the General Assembly high-level meeting on AIDS in 2011. And the uh, declaration from that meeting is very, very clear uh, that all governments are strongly encouraged to implement evidence-based programs and interventions focused on the populations that are most affected by HIV. So, of course, it's frustrating from a UN point of view when we see some governments not doing all they can uh, to implement programs that are safe, effective, and evidence-based. But, of course, we only use it as an opportunity to re-engage our dialogue, to share the information. We never, on behalf of UNAIDS or any UN agency, will never propose any intervention or any program or any policy that is not evidence-based, proven to be effective and proven to be safe. So we're very confident that all of our guidelines and all of our recommendations are not only based on really good evidence, but they actually save money. Uh, and we've shown time and time again that for every dollar smartly invested in an HIV program, it will not only have a positive public health benefit, but it have a, nevit, a net economic benefit of at least a fourfold return on investment for every dollar that's spent wisely and appropriately on the right interventions on HIV prevention, you'll get a fourfold return on investment. And from in a time of government austerity, when budgets are tight, everyone is watching every euro or every dollar, it's extremely important to show to any government agency, to any funding agency, that what we're doing not only protects public health, but actually is a very good return on investment. Yeah. One of the goals of UNAIDS, as far as I remember, is to get 90% of injecting drug users who are living with HIV to treatment. Uh, but according to some estimations, 10% of injecting drug users sit in prisons where there are no access to any services. Do you think that this goal, goal can be achieved without major criminal reforms, criminal law reforms in these countries? Well, that's a very interesting question because we have seen, again, a few countries take the lead in very innovative and model programs around harm reduction, around access to treatment for HIV and hepatitis, for people in prison settings. And in fact, our co-sponsor UN agency, UNODC, is taking the global and regional lead on this issue and supporting governments in the region on very innovative, evidence-based programs on how to both protect prison health, protect the health of prisoners, and also make sure that 
uh, prisoners get the same access to life-saving services, prevention, and treatment services that would be available to any citizen of the population, even those that are not within a prison setting. And so we have very successful examples uh, of how these programs have been implemented, particularly in Moldova, that I'm very familiar with, and very innovative programs that even include the provision of opiate substitution therapy, methadone, for prisoners in the Republic of Moldova, and they've been very successful. And so we already have a good evidence base that this is not only based on abstract literature coming from uh, countries in the European Union or coming from Australia or coming from a safe injection site in the city of Vancouver. This is evidence that it actually works even in the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia and it should be rapidly scaled up. Because someone with HIV or someone at risk for HIV will for some time be in a prison setting. But sooner or later that person is going to be back in the public and they will need access to the same services and they will need access to information and knowledge about their status. And so when we call for 90% of people with HIV to know their status, and 90% of those that should be on treatment, it applies equally and fairly to all groups and subgroups of the population. There should be no basis for discrimination saying, oh, that's only for people that are not drug users, or that's only for heterosexuals, or that's only for people who are non-sex workers. No, the opposite. Uh, people who are at disproportionate risk for HIV, people whose behavior puts them as part of a, a key population most at risk for HIV should indeed have priority access to these services because they're the ones who need it most. And by accessing these life-saving services, they can protect their health, their own health, and the health of people they're close to and their entire community. Does your agency have a position on the criminalization of drug users? Uh, we are very clear, um, and it's not, uh, it's not only a UNAIDS position. This is a joint position that, uh, for example, drug detention centers for people who are convicted of drug-related offenses are not effective. And this is a common position on behalf of all UN agencies that countries should be strong, strongly encouraged to not use drug detention centers as an effective way of either dealing with an epidemic of drug use or preventing HIV infection amongst injecting drug users. And there was even evidence presented at the dialogue this morning, very interesting evidence from Malaysia that showed that the vast majority of people that had gone through criminal detention centers in Malaysia very quickly after release from these centers went back to using drugs. Whereas people who, uh, also in Malaysia, who were able to access low threshold, uh, community-based harm reduction services uh, were much more successful in preventing HIV infection, hepatitis B and C infection, uh, and the overall process of rehabilitation was much higher, much, much higher, and much more cost effective. So. Uh, we, and in fact, over the next few months, there's going to be a very active discussion in the international community in the lead up to the United Nations special session on drugs in New York in April 2016 about issues related to criminalization of drug use and of drug users. And so we welcome on behalf of the UN, this is a critical opportunity to really take a public health approach to issues like drug addiction and drug use and make sure that at least there is an essential basic set of services consistent with UN policies that are available to all people at risk for HIV, including injecting drug users. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.